Hey everyone, welcome back to our chapter book read along of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We are finishing up chapter 16, which is the second to last chapter in this book. So we are getting really close to the end here, people. There's a lot of exciting things happening. What I would like you guys to do as we have been starting off our chapter book read alongs is review this beginning. If you are watching with someone, feel free to pause and talk about some of the important things that we have read so far in our story, or maybe something that you really enjoyed. Now, here goes my quick review. Harry Potter is the boy who lived. He survived being attacked by an evil dark wizard named Voldemort when he was just a baby. Sadly, his parents died and he had to go live with his mean aunt, uncle, and cousin, the Dursleys. They are non-magical, which is called muggles, and they were just not nice people. Harry learns that he is a wizard when he was 11 years old. He got his letter to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, went shopping at Diagon Alley and to Gringotts Wizard Bank with Hagrid, hopped on the Hogwarts Express, and went to school, where he met a couple of very good friends, Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger. They have been learning all about how to be witches and wizards. They are in Gryffindor House, which is one of the four houses of Hogwarts, and Harry is on the Quidditch team. Now, there is one more thing, a mystery that our trio has learned all about. There is a three-headed dog mysteriously guarding a trap door in Hogwarts. They find out that it has something to do with a man named Nicholas Flamel. He created the Sorcerer's Stone, and that is what is hiding in Hogwarts. It is being protected by multiple different teachers. They have spells and enchantments. We are about to see what happens because Harry also learned that Voldemort himself is trying to get the stone and come back. So our young trio thinks the Professor Snape is down there trying to get the stone for Voldemort this very evening where we finished up our chapter. We will now see what happens in chapter 16 through the trap door. Here goes! A few seconds later, they were there, outside the third floor corridor, and the door was already ajar. Well, there you are, Harry said quietly. Snape's already got past Fluffy. Seeing the open door somehow seemed to impress upon all three of them what was facing them. Underneath the cloak, Harry turned to the other two. If you want to go back, I won't blame you, he said. You can take the cloak. I won't need it now. Don't be stupid, said Ron. We're coming, said Hermione. They pushed the door open. As the door creaked, low, rumbling growls met their ears. All three of the dog's noses sniffed madly in their direction, even though they couldn't see him. What's that at his feet? Hermione whispered. Looks like a harp, said Ron. Snape must have left it here. It must wake up the moment you stop playing, said Harry. Well, here goes. He put Hagrid's flute to his lips and blew. It wasn't really a tune, but from the first note, the beast's eyes began to droop. Harry hardly drew breath. Slowly, the dog's growls ceased. It tottered on its paws and fell to its knees, then slumped to the ground, fast asleep. Keep playing! Ron warned Harry as they slipped out of the cloak and crept towards the trap door. They could feel the dog's hot, smelly breath as they approached the giant heads. I think we'll be able to pull the door open, said Ron, peering over the dog's back. Want to go first, Hermione? No, I don't. All right. Ron gritted his teeth and stepped carefully over the dog's legs. He bent and pulled the ring of the trap door, which swung up and open. What do you see? Hermione said anxiously. Nothing, just black. There's no way of climbing down. We'll have to drop. 
Harry, who was still playing the flute, waved at Ron to get his attention and pointed to himself. You want to go first? Are you sure? said Ron. I don't know how deep this thing goes. Give the flute to Hermione so she can keep him asleep. Harry handed the flute over. In the few seconds' silence, the dog growled and twitched, but the moment Hermione began to play, it fell back asleep into a deep sleep. Harry climbed over it and looked down through the trap door. There was no sign of the bottom. He lowered himself through the hole until he was hanging by his fingertips. Then he looked up at Ron and said, If anything happens to me, don't follow. Go straight to the Owlry and send Hedwig to Dumbledore, right? Right, said Ron. See you in a minute, I hope. And Harry let go. Cold, damp air rushed past him, and he fell down, 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 and flump. With a funny, muffled sort of thump, he landed on something soft. He sat up and felt around, his eyes not used to the gloom. It felt as though he were sitting on some sort of plant. It's okay, he called up to the light that the size of a postage stamp, which was the open trap door. It's a soft landing. You can jump. Ron followed straight away. He landed sprawled next to Harry. What is this stuff? was his first words. Dunno, some sort of plant thing. I suppose it's here to break the fall. Come on, come on, Hermione! The distant music stopped. There was a loud bark from the dog, but Hermione had already jumped. She landed on Harry's other side. We must be miles under the school, she said. Lucky this plant thing's here, really. Lucky, shrieked Hermione. Look at you both! She leapt up and struggled towards the damp wall. She had to struggle because the moment she had landed, the plant had started to twist snake-like tendrils around her ankles. As for Harry and Ron, their legs had already been bound tightly in long creepers without their noticing. Hermione had managed to free herself before the plant got grip on her. Now she watched in horror as the two boys fought to pull the plant off them, but the more they strained against it, the tighter and faster the plant wound around them. Stop moving, Hermione ordered them. I know what this is. It's Devil's Snare. Oh, I'm glad we know what it's called. That's a great help, snarled Ron, leaning back, trying to stop the plant from curling around his neck. Shut up. I'm trying to remember how to kill it, said Hermione. Well, hurry up. I can't breathe, Harry gasped, wrestling with what curled around his chest. Devil's Snare, Devil's Snare. What did Prof Professor Sprout say? It likes the dark and damp. So light a fire, Harry choked. Yes, of course, but there's no wood, Hermione cried, wringing her hands. Have you gone mad, Ron bellowed. Are you a witch or not? Oh, right, said Hermione, and she whipped out her wand, waved it, muttered something, and sent a jet of blue bell flames she had used on Snape on the plant. In a matter of seconds, the two boys felt it loosening its grip as it cringed away from the light and warmth. Wriggling and flailing, it unraveled itself from their bodies, and they were able to pull free. Lucky you pay attention in herbology, Hermione, said Harry, who joined her by the wall, wiping sweat from his face. Yeah, said Ron, and lucky Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. There's no wood, honestly. This way, said Harry, pointing down a stone passageway, which was the only way on. All they could hear apart from their footsteps was a gentle drip of water trickling down the walls. The passageway sloped downwards, and Harry was reminded of Gringotts, with an unpleasant jolt of his heart. He remembered the dragons said to be guarding the vaults of the wizard bank. If they met a dragon, a fully grown dragon... Norbert had been bad enough. Can you hear something? Ron whispered. Harry listened. A soft rustling and a clinking seemed to be coming from up ahead. Do you think it's a ghost? I don't know. Sounds like wings to me. There's light ahead. I can see moving. They reached the end of the passage and saw before them a brilliantly lit chamber, its ceiling arching high above them, 
It was full of small, jewel-bright birds, fluttering and tumbling all around the room. On the opposite side of the chamber was a heavy wooden door. Do you think they'll attack us if we cross the room? said Ron. Probably, said Harry. They don't look very vicious, but I supposed if they all swooped down at once. Well, there's nothing for it. I'll run. He took a deep breath, covered his face with his arms, and sprinted across the room. He expected to feel sharp beaks and claws tearing at him at any second, but nothing happened. He reached the door and touched. He pulled on the handle. It was locked. The other two followed him. They tugged on the heavy door. It wouldn't budge, not even when Hermione used her Aloha Mora charm. Now what? said Ron. These birds, they can't be here just for decoration, said Hermione. They watched the birds soaring overhead, glittering. Glittering? They're not birds, Harry said suddenly. They're keys, winged keys. Look carefully. So that must mean, he looked around the chamber while the other two squinted up at the flock of keys. Yes, look, broomsticks. We've got to catch the key to the door. But there are hundreds of them. Ron examined the lock on the door. We're looking for a big old-fashioned one, probably silver, like the handle. They seized a broomstick each and kicked off into the air, soaring into the midst of the cloud of keys. They grabbed and snatched, but the bewitched key darted and dived, so they quickly, and it was almost impossible to catch one. Not for nothing, though, was Harry the youngest seeker in a century. He had a knack for spotting things other people didn't. After a minute weaving about through the whirl of rainbow feathers, he noticed a large silver key that had a bent wing, as if it had already been caught and stuffed roughly into the keyhole. That one, he called to the others. That big one, there, no, there, with the bright blue wings. The feathers are all crumpled on one side. Ron went speeding in the direction that Harry was pointing and crashed into the ceiling, nearly fell off his broom. We've got to close in on it. Harry called, not taking his eyes off the key with the damaged wing. Ron, you come at it from above. Hermione, stay below and stop it from going down. I'll try and catch it. Right. Now! Ron dived. Hermione rocketed upwards. The key dodged them both and Harry streaked after it and sped towards the wall. Harry leaned forward and with a nasty crunching noise pinned it against the stone with one hand. Ron and Hermione's cheers echoed around the high chamber. They landed quickly, and Harry ran to the door, the key struggling in his hand. He rammed it into the lock and turned. It worked. The moment the lock had clicked open, the key took flight again, looking very battered now that it had been caught twice. Ready? Harry asked the other two, his hand on the door handle. They nodded. He pulled the door open. The next chamber was so dark they couldn't see anything at all. But as they stepped into it, light suddenly flooded the room and revealed an astonishing sight. They were standing on the edge of a huge chessboard. Behind the black chessmen, which were all taller than they were, and carved from what looked like black stone, facing them, way across the chamber, were the white pieces. Harry, Ron, and Hermione shivered slightly. The towering white chessmen had no faces. Now what do we do? Harry whispered. It's obvious, isn't it? said Ron. We've got to play our way across the room. Behind the white pieces, they could see another door. How? said Hermione nervously. I think we're going to have to be chessmen. He walked up to the black knight and put his hand out to touch the knight's horse. At once, the stone sprang to life. The horse pawed the ground, and the knight turned his helmeted head and looked down at Ron. Do we, uh, have to join you to get across? The black knight nodded. Ron turned to the other two. This wants thinking about, he said. I suppose we've got to take a place of three black pieces. Harry and Hermione stayed quiet, watching Ron think. Finally, he said, Now, don't be offended or anything, but neither of you are good at chess. 
We're not offended, said Harry quickly. Just tell us what to do. Well, Harry, you take the place of that bishop, and Hermione, you go there instead of that castle. What about you? I'm going to be a knight, said Ron. The chessmen seemed to be of listening, because at these words a knight, a bishop, and a castle turned their backs on the white pieces and walked off the board, leaving three empty squares which Harry, Ron, and Hermione took. White always plays first in chess, said Ron, peering across the board. Yes, look! A white pawn had moved forward two squares. Ron started to direct the black pieces. They moved silently wherever he sent them. Harry's knees were trembling. What if they lost? Harry, move diagonally four squares to the right. Their first real shock came when their other knight was taken. The white queen smashed him to the floor and dragged him off the board, where he lay quite still, face down. Had to let that happen, said Ron, looking shaken. Leaves you free to take that bishop. Hermione, go on. Every time one of their men was lost, the white pieces showed no mercy. Soon there was a huddle of limp black players slumped along the wall. Twice, Ron only just noticed in time that Harry and Hermione were in danger. He himself darted around the board, taking almost as many white pieces as they lost black ones. We're nearly there, he muttered suddenly. Let me think, let me think. The white queen turned her blank face towards him. Yes, said Ron softly. It's the only way. I've got to be taken. No, Harry and Hermione shouted. That's chess, snapped Ron. You've got to make some sacrifices. I'll make my move and she'll take me. That leaves you free to checkmate the king, Harry. But... Do you want to stop Snape or not? Ron, look, if you don't hurry up, he'll already have the stone. There was nothing else for it. Ready, called Ron, his face pale but determined. Here I go. Now, don't hang around once we have won. He stepped forward and the White Queen pounced. She struck Ron hard around the head with her stone arm and he crashed to the floor. Hermione screamed but stayed on her square. The white queen dragged Ron to the side. He looked as if he'd been knocked out. Shaking, Harry moved three places to the left. The white king took off his crown and threw it at Harry's feet. They had won. The chessmen parted and bowed, leaving the door ahead clear. With one last desperate look back at Ron, Harry and Hermione charged through the door and up to the next passageway. What if he's... He'll be all right, said Harry, trying to convince himself. What do you reckon's next? We've had sprouts. That's devil's snare. Flitwick's must have been the charms on the keys. McGonagall transfigured the chessmen to make them alive. That leaves Quirrell's spell and Snape's. They had reached another door. All right, Harry whispered. Go on. Harry pushed it open. A disgusting smell filled their nostrils, making both of them pull their robes up over their noses. Eyes watering, they saw, flat on the floor in front of them, a troll, even larger than the one they had tackled, out cold with a bloody lump on his head. I'm glad we didn't have to fight that one, Harry whispered, as they stepped carefully from over his massive legs. Come on, I can't breathe. He pulled open the next door, both of them hardly daring to look at what came next. But there was nothing very frightening in there. Just a table with seven differently shaped bottles, standing in a line. Snipes, said Harry. What do we have to do? They stepped over the threshold, and immediately a fire sprang up behind them in the doorway. It wasn't ordinary fire, either. It was purple. At the same instant, black flames shot up from the doorway leading onwards. They were trapped. Look! Hermione seized a roll of paper lying next to the bottles. Harry looked over her shoulder as she read it. Danger lies before you, while safety lies behind. Two of us will help you, which 
whatever you would find. One among us seven will let you move ahead. Another will transport the drinker back instead. Two among our number hold only nettle wine. Three of us are killers waiting hidden in line. Choose unless you wish to stay here forevermore. To help you with your choice, we'll give you these clues for. First, however slyly the poison tries to hide, you will always find some on Nettle Wine's left side. Second, different are those who stand at either end. But if you would move onwards, neither is your friend. Third, as you see clearly, are all different size. Neither dwarf nor giant holds death in their insides. Fourth, the second left and the second on the right are twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Hermione let out a great sigh, and Harry, amazed, saw she was smiling at the very last thing he felt like doing. Brilliant, said Hermione. This isn't magic, it's logic. A puzzle. A lot of the greatest wizards haven't gotten out of logic. They'd be stuck in here forever. But so will we, won't we? Of course not, said Hermione. Everything we need here is on this paper. Seven bottles. Three are poison, two are wine. One will get us safely through the black fire, and one will take us back through the purple. But how do we know which to drink? Give me a minute. Hermione read the paper several more times. Then she walked up and down the line of bottles, muttering to herself and pointing at them. At last, she clapped her hands. Got it, she said. The smallest bottle will get us through the black fire towards the stone. Harry looked at the tiny bottle. There's only enough left in there for one of us, he said. That's hardly one swallow. They looked at each other. Which one will get you back through the purple flames? Hermione pointed at the rounded bottle at the right end of the line. You drink that, said Harry. No, listen. Get back to Ron. Grab brooms from the flying key room. They'll get you out of the trap door and past Fluffy. Go straight to the Owlry and send Hedwig to Dumbledore. We need him. I might be able to hold off Snape for a while, but I'm no match for him, really. But Harry, what if you know who's with him? Well, I was lucky once, wasn't I? said Harry, pointing at his scar. I might get lucky again. Hermione's lip trembled, and she suddenly dashed at Harry and threw her arms around him. Hermione! Harry, you're a great wizard, you know. I'm not as good as you, said Harry, very embarrassed, as she let go of him. Me, said Hermione. Books and cleverness. There are more important things. Friendship and bravery and... Oh, Harry, be careful. You drink first. You're sure which is which, aren't you? Positive, said Hermione. She took a long drink from the round bottle at the end and shuddered. It's not poison, Harry said anxiously. No, but it's like ice. Quick, go before it wears off. Good luck. Take care. Go. Hermione turned and walked straight through the purple fire. Harry took a deep breath, and picked up the smallest bottle. He turned to face the black flames. Here I come, he said, and he drained the little bottle in one gulp. It was indeed as though ice was flowing through his body. He put the bottle down and walked forward. He braced himself, saw the black flames licking his body, but couldn't feel them. For a moment, he could see nothing but dark fire, and then he was on the other side, the last chamber. There was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. The end of chapter 16, Through the Trap Door. Oh, that is leaving us with so many questions. I don't know who it's going to be in the next chapter, but I can't wait to see. So many exciting things happened. Let's get to our discussion and talk all about it. So my first question for you all, how do Harry, Ron, and Hermione get past Fluffy the Three-Headed Dog? 
they play some music. So Harry brings his little flute and just playing even one note made the dog go sleepy. And they had to keep it playing though, right? What happened when they stopped playing music? The dog woke up. So what happens once they got through the trap door? They fell down and landed in a plant, which they thought was to catch their fall, right? But it was actually something else. Do you remember what the plant was called? Devil's Snare. That does not sound like a good plant name. So what is this devil snare? What was it doing to Harry, Ron, and Hermione? It started wrapping itself around them and grabbing on and tightening and tightening. Ooh. So how do they survive it? Hermione remembers something, right? So she remembers that devil snare does not like sunlight or heat. So she has a spell and makes some fire and saves them all. How do the three get past the test of the flying keys? This was kind of Harry's specialty, wasn't it? Since he knows how to play Quidditch and he can see that tiny little ball on the Quidditch field. So they got on broomsticks and they figured out which key it was and they worked together to catch it. How does Ron guide Harry and Hermione to victory in wizard chess? Well, that's his specialty. He's very good at wizard chess and he was strategic and thought about things. But what does he do in the end so that Harry can win the game? He sacrifices his playing. So he got hit on the head, ouch, by the queen and knocked out. So he wouldn't have been able to go on, right? Well, we find in the next room, the troll has already been defeated. But what is in that last room that Harry and Hermione go into together? It's potions and a riddle. So the riddle talks about that some potion gets you through forward to the Sorcerer's Stone, one potion takes you backward, bunch are poison, some are just wine. So Hermione thinks it through and figures it out. What happens? There's just enough potion for Harry to go forward and Hermione to go back to check on Ron and then go let Dumbledore know that there is somebody down there. Then Harry steps through and sees someone, but we're not going to know until the next chapter. Oh, I can't wait. Our next videos are going to be the last chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I hope you have enjoyed our reading and discussing of this fun book, and we will see you guys next time. Bye, everyone!